Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Brittany Boston, and I will be the facilitator for the webinar today. Um, before we get started with the information we have, I do want to take care of a few housekeeping items. Just so you are aware, all participants are in listen-only mode, um, and the webinar is being recorded and will be shared at a later date and order for you to review or individuals who were unable to participate today. We will be taking time for questions and comments, so please feel free to put those either in the chat or questions box, depending on the device you logged in with today. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to our presenters for the day. Hi, everybody. This is Kathy Olson Tracy, and I hope that uh, we are finding you all safe and um, adjusting to this new short term normal. Um, I do think that we will eventually get back to a new normal, um, but until then, I understand you guys have some lingering questions. So I wanted to take some time to review highlights from um, the adult education administrators meeting, um, talk about your common questions, and then give you time to even answer, ask more based on um, what you're hearing today. So we're gonna be talking mostly today about virtual assessments, onboarding new students, summer classes, and what 21, FY21 may look like at least in the first few months of the fiscal year. Um, with that being said, a lot of the questions that were collected are referencing information about the TAPE test and the process test and some general assessment questions. So before I start uh, going into more specific detail, um, Don um, Hughes and Catherine Porter are going to share some highlights from our prior meeting that were um, asked again for clarification. So I'm going to give them a chance to go over some information uh, really quickly. So Dawn, uh, go ahead. All right, thank you. So first we want to start with a poll question. We have two today. Um, it should be pretty brief and easy for you to answer. So for the first question is, what is your program's most immediate need for professional development at this time? And in this specific question, um, there are five choices, but you can only select one option. So just focus on what your program's most immediate need is. About 60% of you have voted so far, so I'll leave this open for about 10 more seconds. Okay, we still have a few more active voters, so. <clears throat> All right, it looks like most people have voted now, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that particular poll. And then we have one more question for you. The next question is, when do most of your staff and instructors need professional development for remote learning? And in this option, you can select, or this question, excuse me, you can select more than one option. And this will um, help guide the PDN in future professional development activities.
All right, about five more seconds. It looks like almost everybody has voted. Again, you can select more than one option. All right, I'll go ahead and close that out and then we'll go ahead and get started with our presentation today. So thank you very much. So the first item that we're going to be talking about today is remote testing information. We wanted to let you know that coming very soon, the PDN will be providing remote testing guidance through three separate webinars. Uh, we will be having webinars on Best Plus 2.0. That is a test that is for ESL only. The CASAS tests, both life and work and goals, there will be a webinar just on that for remote testing guidance, which is completely separate from the CASAS goals webinar that we will be having for implementation. And then also there will be a remote testing guidance webinar for TABE 1112. And just to remind everyone that the CASAS goals will be available as an ABE ASC option starting July 1st. In the next section, we're going to review some of the FY21 assessment guidelines for ABE and ASC. And then we were gonna answer some questions from our CASA session that Catherine and I presented last week at the virtual admin meeting. So this section will help frame some of the answers and questions. So first of all, programs may choose to continue using TABE 1112 and FY21. TABE is not going away. Um, instead, the use of CASAS goals is being added as an option for FY21, and that again starts July 1st, 2020. Programs can choose to shift students from one test series to the other during the fiscal year if they desire, but each pre and post test must be within the same test series. So that is, if TABE is given as a pretest, then TABE must be given as the post test, and then the same would be true for CASAS as well. All ABE ASE students must be given a reading test. So that could either be TABE 1112 reading or CASAS goals reading, with the exception of courses that are classified as math only. And to avoid test fatigue, uh, we students should not be tested with both TABE 1112 math and reading and CASAS goals math and reading during the same testing session. That would be four tests. Programs have the flexibility to choose between reading and math assessments, as long as the pre and post testing sequence is within the same test series. So for example, programs could choose to give a student CASAS goals reading, but also TABE 1112 math or vice versa. And then ICCB will be providing both the policy and DAISY details prior to FY21. So this is Catherine, and um, as Dawn said a minute ago, we're going to answer now some questions that were asked but not answered during the CASA session that we did at last week's virtual administrators meeting. We are going to compile these questions and possibly additional questions from today into a formal FAQ, so be on the lookout for that. And to start with, uh, there were several questions about the Illinois pilot of CASA's goals. As a reminder, this past fall, four Illinois adult ed programs implemented CASAS goals. Both reading and math were tested, as well as the e-test and the paper test. Okay, we can have the next slide. So a number of you asked uh, these questions. Why did ICCB sponsor a pilot of CASAS goals, and what were the results? So prior to FY20, ICCB received a number of requests from the field to allow CASAS goals as an alternative ABE-ASE 
assessment due to the fact that some Illinois programs were quite dissatisfied with the Table 1112. So ICCB asked the PDN to conduct a pilot uh, to inform a potential statewide rollout of CASA's goals. However, because the number of students assessed in the pilot was relatively small, conclusions regarding NRS level placement and NRS level gains cannot be made. However, programs may choose to monitor their own data for results related to NRS placement and NRS level gains. In other words, you can certainly try it out on your own and see how it does for you starting July 1st. Okay, next slide. Is the CASAS goals e-test web-based? And the answer is yes. And can programs already using the e-test for ESL use their current web-based testing units for CASAS goals? The answer is yes, um, that CASAS WTUs or web-based testing units can be used for any CASAS test. Next slide. So this is an important question and I thank whoever asked it for bringing this up. Um, is there a score correlation between CASAS Life and Work Series for ESL and CASAS goals so that programs can use the scores of English learners that score above exit criteria? The answer here is no. Uh, ESL students who meet exit criteria on CASAS Life and Work Series, that would be 235 and above, must be tested with either Table 11 and 12 or starting July 1st, CASAS goals, when transitioning from ESL to ABE instruction. Okay, next one. Will um, our, uh, we owe Title I partners be able to use CASAS goals? And the answer is yes, as long as they receive training. Title I has an extensive list of tests that are approved by the Department of Labor and um, CASAS goals is one of them. And um, our last FAQ from last week was, when will the CASA schools training be held and how many PD hours? So very soon we will release uh, information to the field about the implementation training, including the number of PD hours and um, uh, the schedule and so on. And the training will have no cost associated with it. Okay, um, those were our FAQs. And I think we're ready to turn it back over to um, Kathy at this point. Okay, so um, before we start moving on, I'd like to kind of see what follow-up questions do you have for um, Don and Catherine as they relate to the CASAS goals, the TAB 1112, um, as far as the current testing practices that we have. We'll move into virtual testament assessment in just a second, but what questions do you guys have about either of those? We did have one question, um, and I apologize, I just had a string of police cars drive past my street, so I was trying to wait until they were passed before I unmuted myself. Um, but referring to the remote testing trainings, um, does, is the timeline for when those are going to be presented, will that be prior to July 1? So uh, Dawn has answered in the, in the chat box that says, yes, we are hopeful that the remote testing trainings will happen in May. So, so let me clarify what we're talking about here. You're asking about the assess the test training to deliver the CASAS testing that we will have virtually through webinars or face to face. And those will happen because with the CASAS goals, you have to be trained prior to purchasing the tests. So, yes, those will be coming out. So um, I want to clarify, we're talking about that, not virtual train testing. Um, does that make sense? I don't want to get those two lumped together. We are doing um, training for the um, test uh, testing practices for the CASAS um, and for the TABE, the remaining of this fiscal year handled through webinars and handled through um, 
other methods because we can't do face-to-face. -face. Just wanted to make that clear because now we're gonna leap over to the conversation about virtual assessments, okay? Right, so this is Catherine. So just to clarify so even further, so there's CASA's goals implementation training that has nothing to do with remote testing. That is just how to give the CASA's goals, how to order the CASA's goals, the pricing structure, uh, how to give the e-test and the paper test. All of that is covered in the CASA's implementation training that will definitely happen in May. And a number of you are asking those questions right now in the, in the question box. How do you purchase it? Uh, um, when will it be? Et cetera. So you will receive that information shortly in the CASA's implementation trainings. So that has nothing to do with remote testing. Right. We will train you remotely on how to right. administer the test. <laughs> that's but, right. <laughs> that's that's but, the confusion, right. But the virtual testing, okay. So if we feel that all of those questions were addressed, I want to start talking to you guys about virtual assessments. So there was one other question, okay. Kathy. There were several quick questions about the cost of the CASA's okay, goals go test. And so that information will be coming out with the training information because again, you cannot purchase CASA schools without the implement, implementation training piece. So that will be coming to you very soon. And we know that some of you have deadlines in May to make those purchases through your program. So we are definitely keeping that in mind as we are putting together the training and getting that out to you. Right. One of the reasons why we keep saying everything is going to be happening soon is because much like um, your worlds where you had to flip everything overnight, our service center network not only had to flip everything overnight, but develop new trainings for everybody to accommodate the new need for um, training on distance learning delivery methods and strategies. So their original timeline got shifted a little bit with this new demand for training. So I, I'm asking you to be a little bit patient because we know that you need this information soon. Um, those of you who want to make purchases with end of year dollars need to understand what that looks like. So we recognize that, um, but I've had, we've had uh, the professional development network very busy in other trainings. So please be a little bit patient when we keep saying that information is coming out soon uh, because it will come out and it will be in May and you will have time to make your choices with whatever test assessment practices you decide to go with and they'll be able to guide you in your decisions now um, with that being said to update you where we are on virtual assessments um, many of you have may have been uh, attending some of the webinars that have been put on by the test publishers so so here's where we, we are the best plus 2.0 currently is the only assessment that is allowed to be delivered virtually. The TABE 1112 and the CASAS tests are working on plans to develop so that those assessments can be given remotely. I expect a very, very rapid turnaround time on that. So what will happen as soon as we get the go ahead, and by that it means um, the TABE 1112 publishers and the CASAS publishers let us know that the tests are ready. The PDN will work with a couple of programs to administer the tests as a pilot. When I'm saying pilot, I'm talking about a week to 10 days. We need to run it out quickly, but we need to run it carefully and strategically so that we don't have everyone trying to figure out whatever bugs and hurdles are happening all at one time. So here are the things that we need to think through as a, as a policy statement from the state that we are working on currently. The requirements at this time, and I'm saying that as of 1.30 on April 22nd, because again, this is very fluid and some of these, these conversations are rapidly evolving. What it looks like right now is that you will be allowed to use um, computers and students can use it at home. It remains to be seen if these testing entities will require proctoring software 
or they will allow it via platforms like Zoom or GoToMeetings or anything like that. Those are the current discussions being held by the test publishers. What we will be able, need to be able to say when we give that test is that there is a way to identify the student who is taking the test, whether you have them hold up a, a picture ID or a letter with their address on it or what, whatever we develop as a practice so that that person can be identified as the test taker. Maybe they certify a statement saying, I am Kathy Olson Tracy. Then we need to actually have for you guys a clear list of technology requirements so we know that the student has the access. Will they have reliable access for an hour, a reliable internet access for that long of time? Um, do they have to use a specific browser? It looks like they'll have to use Chrome for the tape 1112, so we need to figure those out. Is there a certain internet speed that is required? We need to develop those technology requirements. We also need to uh, make sure that anybody administering these tests from the adult ed provider is a trained test administrator. So simply because there's going to be a potential for virtual assessment doesn't mean that any teacher can assess for their students. It must still be administered through a test, um, a trained test provider. Um, and then we need to come up with a strategy of what happens, suppose that a student is taking a test and the internet drops, or um, they're at home and a child wakes up and then they're not able to focus on the rest of the test or whatever happens um, in the middle of being at home. Do we want that test to be picked up from where they left off or do we start it over again? These are the kinds of questions that we're coming up with, with for answers. So what we're hoping to do um, is to work with the first round of people who are testing it to make sure we have some processes in place and then refine them quickly so that not everybody is um, struggling with the same questions at the same time. So there will be a process to this. Right now, what I anticipate is that we will have more direction from the test publishers within the first part of May. Um, I know they're working rapidly to figure this out. So before I go on to any other topics, what questions and concerns do you have about the potential for virtual test administration? We have one question that says, if remote testing is technically available, how can that be equitable for students and programs when not all students have access to technology? So equity is a big issue. We released um, almost $2 million, well, $2 million today for programs to purchase Chromebooks, technology, um, to have lending libraries, internet hotspots, to address some of the equity issues. We have um, allowed a lot of different flexibility. Right now, I recognize the concern, but we don't have all of the answers to how this can be done. Um, we're doing the, the best that we can, considering there are so many um, considerations, the shelter in place as one of them, um, and limited resources across the state for students. So I recognize that that's a concern, um, but I don't think that we're gonna be able to address every one of those across the state, but we are certainly trying to kind of level that playing field for students by making sure we can provide programs with money to buy technology. Okay, any other questions on the potential? Um, there's Okay. Yeah, there's several specific questions coming in about um, do we need cameras? What will the instructions be? Uh, you know, very specific questions. So right. again, I, I would just reiterate that those type of questions will be answered once we get the guidelines from the publishers and then we put together both the pilot and the training for everybody. So I know, I know it's hard, but in a few weeks, 
we will have all of those answers because not even we have those answers right now and we'll be able to roll that out to the field. But they're very good and questions. I'll tell you that the test publishers don't even have those answers yet. The multiple phone calls I've been on with them have included uh, that there will be a very strong likelihood that the computer will require a camera of some form. Okay, that's a very strong likelihood. Now there are other things I'm hearing from test publishers where they will have like an artificial intelligence that is um, accessed so that they can see what windows and browsers are open on the laptop. And so there's a lot of conversation happening. Where it actually lands, I don't have a, an answer for that. I would expect um, the technology to be basic web browser, probably Chrome, as that tends to be the most commonly used browser for some of these delivery methods. I would believe that the computer may have to have a um, camera on it. So for those of you who have determined to purchase um, tablets and or um, laptops for checkouts, you might want to take that into consideration. Um, there are conversations on the horizon about a virtual um, high school equivalency test where students can take it from home. But what's happening is that test providers are and the GED testing service are being very intentional about how they're releasing this because once we start allowing virtual assessments and virtual tests, we will not be able to stop that. That will become one more option in our toolbox. So they are being very intentional with their processes. Um, their biggest concern is not the student taking the test. It is not the technology, it is test security and how to make sure that the GED test or the TABE test don't end up on eBay or Facebook or wherever. So their intentionality in their planning is, is kind of why this is very fluid because they're piloting it in a few places to see how this works before they even give it to us. So um, bear with us as this is a very evolving situation. The current climate has forced these entities to move into virtual assessments and they don't even have the details worked out yet. Now, to, to also add to this conversation, there was a phone call right before this webinar where there is some potential that we may be able to waive some of these assessments uh, um, prior to student enrolling in classes. And again, that's a very fluid conversation from the Department of Education. And we're keeping our eyes on that one to see if we can't give any um, relief to programs and assessment practices. Now, I still very firmly believe what I've said um, for almost 20 years is that assessment should drive instruction. And I'm very leery about moving students into classes without some type of placement, pretest assessment to guide proper instruction. So with that being said, we are very engaged in conversations to see how we can provide relief for everybody on these assessments. Um, that might be a way for us to address the equity issues, but again, very fluid conversations right now. Um, and I hesitate to release a lot of information and then have to backtrack and say, well, today this is the truth, but tomorrow it might be a different story. So right now, what I know to be true is that um, virtual assessments are on the horizon and that we will roll them out uh, carefully and strategically when we have the information. Hey, um, oh, go ahead, Brittany. Sorry. No, I just wanted to let everyone on the call know because we still do have quite a few questions coming in. Um, and these questions will be downloaded and I can share them with Kathy and ICCB as I am sure and have faith that once they are given the information as well, they will share it out to the field and probably hold another webinar or call. Um, and that way, these questions they will already have and be able to answer those once they are given the answers as well. And I will look at those questions um, and try to summarize some answers and get those out via email as well. So um, just type in whatever questions you have and we'll do our best to make sure I get them answered 
by the end of the week. Um, okay, so virtual assessments. I, I'm sorry, you probably don't know any more than you knew coming into this webinar, and I, I truly apologize for that. I had hoped to be able to, to give you some more clarity on that, um, but we're still waiting for the test entities to give us their recommendations so that we can move forward. Um, we do know that it will be allowable under Octa's rules, so that's already cleared and ready to go. Now, um, onboarding new students. As I mentioned, um, literally before this meeting, I had to hang up from that phone call to come to this one. We were talking about the potential of not having to do pre-assessments for students. That conversation is based on some other guidance from Octa. We um, will have that ready for you within the next week because that literally just happened. It shifted the conversation I was going to have today to um, we may have a way to do this because the conversation I was ready for was only serve existing students until the virtual assessment rolls out. And the conversation I'm going to have now is there might be an alternative. Um, and that happened literally two minutes before this webinar. So that's how rapidly things are changing. I will work with Jennifer Foster and um, continue to work with our, our leadership at Octa to get their guidance and see what we can do and how we can best practices for placing students into programs, into classes and what that can look like. Um, so that is happening. And hopefully it will happen before you guys register students for summer classes. So for summer classes, um, both of the details for enrolling students and virtual assessment should be hammered out. Well, they will be because you'll need it. Hammered out by that time, hopefully within the next five to seven days, if you're looking for a more specific timeline so that we can get that information out to you. Um, programs are not required to have summer classes. If you do um, have summer classes, um, let us know how we can help you. If you decide that you're not running summer classes or only serving current students, that is fine as well. That will be up to your discretion as a program, but certainly let us know how we can help you work out with your regional support so that they can kind of communicate with me what your needs are. And I want to go to looking ahead for fiscal year 21 because a lot of the questions that I received from the administrative meeting were referencing remote learning for fiscal year 21. While I don't have a crystal ball, what I do have is the fact, the knowledge that we will probably continue to have um, social distancing guidelines. We will probably continue to have um, issues with this current um, pandemic. And there are, there are discussions about what would happen if we got into a winter session and had to do a shelter in place again. So with that being said, and many programs have already made the determination that their um, fall classes will be at a distance. So with those things being said, I want to encourage you to continue to um, invest your time and effort in your infrastructure for remote and distance learning. I will encourage you to um, have plans in place so that if we have to rapidly move again, we're ready to go. I will encourage you to continue to invest in technology-based instruction. Um, so even if you have face-to-face -face classes, if students are used to using certain technology tools in the classroom, they should be able to access those at home if we have to flip quickly again. With that being said, I will reiterate our policies for distance learning curriculum. At this time, Burlington English is the state supported ESL curriculum. That does not mean it's the only curriculum that you can use 
for ESL. It is the state supported curriculum. And I'm currently working with the ALRC on the distribution of seats for next fiscal year. They are very strategic in their planning and very organized. Um, so we will get some information out in a survey to see how many programs um, would like to continue to, to use the state-sponsored seats for Burlington English. Um, for those of you um, who are purchasing seats, you, you may purchase more seats out of that software or another ESL software if you chose to, okay? So for the ESL side of the house, there are more options. What you will need to do for fiscal year 21, at the end of this year, we were very flexible with our processes, but for fiscal year 21, you will need to send in your course approvals and you will need to indicate what curriculum you're using. If it's something that you are developing yourself um, as a part of like the IDEA, or you're using USA Learns, or you wanna do something like that, you must provide us the syllabus with your course offerings so we know that you're still staying with standard aligned curriculum. So you can use any other curriculum you choose, but you must submit as the entity that's going to use the provider, the course outline um, with the content areas you're going to cover so that we can approve that through Curriculet and make sure that your um, processes or the content is standards aligned. So before I talk about ABE ASC, do we have any ESL questions? We did have one come through. Is it possible to run our ESL courses via an LMS like Blackboard? Yes, you can create your own, but again, what you will need when you turn in your curriculum plan, uh, my curriculum to get the course approval, you will need a course syllabus. And your course syllabus will tell us what content standards you're teaching to. And the other thing I will caution you with is that um, one, of the, one of the approval criteria for using any software, whether you develop it yourself or whether you purchase it from a vendor, is that it is 508 compliant. That means you must develop um, curriculum that is accessible, that will be allowed to read on a screen reader, that is, you know, all of those, all of those issues. So um, that's kind of the one thing that I would caution you with if you're going to use it. Yes, you can but I would also make sure that it's aligned with our content standards and it's 508 compliant. Okay, trying to keep track of all the questions here. Um, I'm gonna stay on the topic of ESL for the moment. Does this mean that we have to turn in curriculum for all ESL levels in an online format? So if you're going to have um, an ESL curriculum that you're going to do and you're going to have an ESL course, your ESL course is available to students, you will have a syllabus that you're going to use. If not a syllabus, you'll have a course outline. If not, you have something that's going to be covered in that window of time. So yes, we would need that. If you're using a vendor, they already have that. You can just download what they have and send it in. If you're creating your own, yes, because you're going to have um, what you're teaching in those specific weeks and days. So your course outline, your course syllabus, whatever that would look like for you will be turned in with the um, course approvals. And we will work with you specifically on specific questions as you have them to make this as streamlined for you as possible. Okay, um, I'm gonna move over from there to 
ABE ASE. I'm going to tell you that is going to be the same concept. For ABE, you may use another vendor for ABE level students. You will submit the request through your curriculum. We will approve that vendor because we will need the same information, the course outline for what you're going to be teaching, and the, the um, provider is 508 compliant and it's standards aligned. If a curriculum has been approved, um, I'm going to use GED Academy as an example um, or essential education for one program, it will be approved for all programs. Okay, and we will have a list of approved publishers on our website as those requests come in. Okay, so all you need to do is let us know what curriculum you're going to choose for ABE. You may develop your own using your own LMS if you choose to. Again, same guidelines. We need the syllabus, it must be, or outline, it must be standards aligned, it must meet our Illinois content standards, and it must be 508 compliant. Although our distance learning policy is changing, our goals have not changed. And ultimately, our goals are to get our students to improve measurable skill gains, to post-secondary education, to industry recognized credentials. So our goals are the same, and those are all hinged and built on standards-based instruction. So our delivery method might be expanding, and our options for curriculum might be growing, but our outcome and our goals are still the same. So they're always going to come back to, um, is it standards aligned? Okay. Now, I get a lot of questions about ASE curriculum. Um, because iPathways is the ASE funded curriculum in the state, and there's a couple reasons for um, ASE be, iPathways being the ASE um, distance learning project. A couple reasons for that. One is it was built with the Illinois content standards specifically in mind. It was built um, with all of the Illinois initiatives strictly in mind. And because we have access to data that we recognize um, and we use annually to review the project, um, I can tell you that we're very, very happy with the measurable skill gains of students who are using that particular curriculum and the test passing rate of students using that curriculum. So we're going to stay with ASE being iPathways specific, but ABE can be anything that you want it to be. And I'm gonna pause there for any final questions on some of these remote learning. So Kathy, we do have several questions coming through as far as the approval process. Um, okay. So if they're, so for example, if they are using Zoom or some type of other video conferencing mm -hmm. software, mm -hmm. uh, but they're teaching the same content and curriculum that they are now, do they still need to submit for approval? If you're using Zoom to just model the current classroom, then all you would put in there is your outline, your um, semester outline, and it will go through very quickly. But if you're doing that, then I'm going to build that um, response on the fact that you probably already have that outline built up because you're not just winging it every week with stuff. You're probably going in a sequential um, organized method, so you've already got that planned. Send in your outline and um, your course approval. And Jane is on this one, and she said that's a course modification. So you, um, if you have a specific question of a, a current course and what you need to do, just email Jane, and we will get that to you rather than you recreating the wheel. Um, and there have been a few questions as well. I know the, the virtual testing is still up in the air. Um, mm -hmm. Has there been any conversation about possibly using current FY20 test scores and if those could be carried over and valid for FY20 if the need arises? 
there that's part of some of the op opportunity or options that we're talking about with octate so they have not given us any definitive answer but that's certainly been a question asked um and that would be a modification of the 120 day rule and we're trying to get some guidance on some of these things as well uh, they have you know they're getting as many questions and are trying to um strategically allow for for alterations in some of these because once you make an alteration in policy, you can't go backwards and then undo that alteration. And every one rule we have touches 10 more things. So a lot of these things may sound like we're not making decisions rapidly, but it's because I wanna make sure if we touch this, what else is it going to impact? And think through it so that there are no unintentional surprises at the end of fiscal year 21. And some more questions about the um, curriculum approval process. Um, is there a specific timeline for submitting the online courses for approval? And is it possible for ICCB to send formal communication to colleges to expedite the institutional curriculum approval process? So the course has to be approved prior to it being offered. We tend to get um, course approvals within done within a week unless there are questions asked, you know, unless we need more information. So um, Jane happens to be texting me right now. She's sending everybody um, the new for the forms for the approval, so you have them. And just prior to the offering of the course. And what curriculum is currently approved for ABE? Well, nobody has asked for any because, and to qualify that, as you move forward um, and we rapidly move to distance learning, we did not require approvals for distance learning options. We just let you use whatever you needed to for your ABE programs and for your ESL programs. Um, we will be continue to be flexible. This is not for us to be difficult. Um, on the ICCB um, frequently asked questions about COVID, there are a listing of so, so, some potential vendors. Um, they were the ones that were at the IASA conference I was able to talk to. They include I Like Math, um, GED Ascent or Essential Education, Aztec, Reading Horizons. I mean, there's, there's a variety of them there. If you're looking for something to select from, that might be a good starting point to look at um, all of those programs do have online learning i think national geographic was in there so you may pick any of those and they are all very aware of standard alignment and they will give you their information very quickly um, and we can get it approved so if you're using something for the summer or because of this covid 19 i will guarantee you we're going to figure out a way to make sure it continues to work And then we did have a request for some clarification on the summer courses. Are those to be listed at a distance as well? Yes. Because right now, um, what I, well, okay, let me backtrack that one. I'm going to say yes, because I, I believe most programs will only have distance learning in the summer. Um, if you believe that your organization will allow um, some form of hybrid face-to-face -face once the shelter in place is, is released, you may continue to do that. I will caution you that we will always adhere to the governor's guidelines of shelter in place and or social distancing. So um, you will need to make sure that whatever you're doing follows those guidelines. And um, I don't, personally see us getting away from that in the next four to six weeks. So it might make sense to plan them as distance learning courses. But if you feel that you'll be allowed to have some form of hybrid face-to-face -face meetings after the shelter in place is lifted, you may plan for that. Just again, understand that if we continue them, we will, we will not allow face-to-face -to, -face, um, to go in contrast to what the governor's um, 
directions are. Okay, and still some questions coming through regarding the um, the curriculum approval. So it okay. sounds like we use our currently approved standards aligned ESL classes. We may use Blackboard as a delivery method if necessary without extra approval. Right, you'll just need a course modification to go from face-to-face -to, -face to distance learning, yeah. Okay, and so that would qualify for the summer sessions yes. as well. if they're moving them to the distance learning, that's all that needs to be approved. Correct. And if you have, like I said, if you have a specific question, just shoot us an email and we'll answer that before you develop, devote any time to any um, paperwork that you may or may not need to do. I'd rather we were able to answer your questions quickly um, and help you rather than making you spend time on things you don't need to. Um, and then if a software program is approved to use in the fall, will that approval be temporary or permanent? So in other words, can we continue to use that software after FY 2020? You will be allowed to continue that software. It was always our the ICCB intent to expand on distance learning policies and to expand, expand on approvals. One of the things that we had done prior to COVID was figured out what we would need to be able to approve new options. And then, um, then we threw that outside the window and said, okay, anything goes for the COVID-19 emergency transition plan. Um, so we're trying to kind of go back and put these processes back in place so that there's an approval. Once a curriculum has been approved, it will remain as an approved curriculum for FY21 and beyond. And then, oh, Catherine just answered that. Someone asked, um, who should I contact for setting up for online CASAS testing? And that is Catherine Porter at the ALRC. Okay, and um, while we're talking, Jane is drafting an email for everybody to go to the field about all the documents, course approvals. It will be shot out before this webinar is even done, and you will have that information available to you. Okay, and those are currently all of the questions that are coming in that can be answered at this time. Okay, so what I will do is um, get the download of all the questions, um, put them in an email response so that you have them in writing from us to clarify any questions. Jane has already sent or is in process of already sending out the modification forms for courses, course approval, pro all of those forms are coming your way. Before you jump into them, um, if you have questions, reach out to us. That way we can help you so you're not spending too much time on them and we can get things approved relatively quickly. Um, and again, once a vendor has been approved, it will be approved for everybody and it will be approved ongoing. Um, key takeaways on that are standards aligned. So, um, if there's any questions on that one, let me know. And I hope I will just strongly encourage you to consider um, the continuing, continued investment in time and effort into your distance learning technology initiatives, because I don't see this um, current crisis ending easily and quickly and soon. I think we're gonna have lingering impacts for a while and to be able to serve the, our students, we, we're going to need to have these um, tools in place. So as you're looking at what FY21 may look like, and I, again, don't have a crystal ball, I think we're going to see a little bit more of where we are right now. Uh, maybe shorter bursts of shelter in place, maybe um, social distancing. Um, it could look like a lot of different things. 
But um, our, again, I will reiterate our priority is for your safety, the safety of your staff and the safety of your students. So however we can support you in that, we are here to be able to work with you. So if there are no more um, lingering questions, I will let you kind of check off of the email if you've got the information or email off of the webinar, if you've got the information that you um, needed. Um, and I, I do apologize that a lot of the information was coming soon, but that's kind of where we are. And um, I am available. Most of you now have my cell phone number, but uh, for those of you who wanna have a conference call, reach out to Nora, we'll get you scheduled and we will be able to uh, work with you. And if you had not yet seen my email, the uh, $2 million was um, released today and we'll um, be working with you guys to get that money in your hands so that you could request it rapidly. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to uh, send me an email and we'll get a phone call scheduled. Kathy, do you have any information that you could share about the um, grant application for FY21? Yes. Um, right now, it has been um, developed, the application process. It's going to be a continuation that will go. Um, it's going in review because, again, these things have to have a review process before we can release them. So um, that one is also going to come out very early in May. It will come out quickly and it will be very reflective of prior continuation year experiences. And any idea um, what the performance measures um, will be impacting funding for next year? So are you, at, okay, so as of, 159 on April 22nd. Okay, again, very fluid. Right now, I'm operating under the idea of level funding um, for adult education in general. And with that and said, the performances, we know that there uh, will be no penalties for this year because of the COVID-19, but how that will impact our, our overall distribution, um, we will communicate that. Um, but what I do think we'll be using is the rolled up averages. So the prior years will help. In other words, you're not going to be hurt from this year because of COVID. It's not going to hurt anybody. And we did have a question as to um, whether weekly meetings or weekly updates are in the works as this is such a fluid and ever-changing situation i will be more than happy to do weekly updates um i hope to have the the tricky thing is i want them to be substantial information and i don't want to keep having updates of we're still working on it or it's still in process um so the two things we'll do i will have updates webinars weekly as requested I will have webinars as soon as relevant information comes out so that we can get information distributed. And I will have a conference call with anybody who wants to have program specific questions. So we can do that in three ways. So yes, I will have them. You're not required to attend them, but I will put them out if this is what you feel is meaningful for you. But when I get an important one, I will certainly let you know that, that the new an update is gonna be relevant for new information. So we did have another question come through about what will be prioritized for funding for next year then, student test scores, number of students, et cetera. I'm pausing on that one because let me put that out and um, once we put the, the grant application out, I will have that information ready for you. Again, nobody's gonna be hurt because of COVID-19. We're not gonna have any penalties for programs on that. Beyond that statement, I don't have the answers. 
And we did have some se several questions come through about the Constitution exam and whether there's been any talks of moving this to a virtual platform as well. The there have been conversations about the Constitution test that are lingering and we are still trying to get resolution on some of those answers. Currently, I don't believe we have the capacity to move the Constitution test to a virtual assessment because it is um, an Illinois specific issue and test security is uh, more of, a, of an issue. So I don't know that we actually have the infrastructure to be able to do that remotely, uh, but I am looking at some other options. Okay, and we had a question about expenditure funds and um, whether that will be extended, perhaps um, either to September 30th or December 30th. And when will we know this? Because if not, we have to find a way to spend or decide at this late date what we need to return. At this time, we have not had any information about allowing to carry over funding. That is not an ICCB specific request. We are under um, GATA, the grant accountability um, system. We have some other steps to have to happen. So at today's conversation, I'm going to suggest that you plan on having the money expended out by June 30th. With that being said, budget modifications are not due until May 31st. We are hoping to get additional guidance on whether or not we could carry money over. Um, but at this time, that is um, coming from, it's a legislative issue. And as you know, legislators aren't in session right now. Um, so we're trying to get work, things worked through these processes so we can figure them out and get you that information. I would plan on um, spending state dollars first, and I would plan on having a June 30th end of year as always. And then as soon as we get information about carrying over, we will let you know. But as of today, we have not had that um, information provided to us. We did have another question come through regarding constitution tests, um, stating that ISB has waived the constitution test for the remainder of the school year. Um, is this something that ICCB could do or has considered doing? We have considered it and we are looking at the policy um, that goes along with it. And then will student test scores essentially be disregarded for this fiscal year since you said there won't be any penalties for okay. lower performance so related to COVID? I want to, I, I want to kind of clarify that. Individual programs in the state of Illinois will not be penalized. The ICCB as a state, we are still held to our standards that we have to achieve. We are still held to the outcomes that we indicate by octe. Okay, that has not changed. What has is we are not passing on that pressure to the programs. Um, so I am asking that if virtual testing becomes something we can do for you to test students to the best of your ability. I'm gonna ask that you continue to work towards achieving the measurable skill gains to the best of your ability, because as a state, we are still required to achieve our outcomes. We are just not penalizing programs this year. Okay, we had one more come through. To follow up on performance measures for FY21, will programs prior year NRS history include FY18 data as opposed to exclusively FY19 which reflect the new TAB 11 test. We will use FY19 data. 
Um, we're not going to exclude a year's worth of, of data. What we're saying is we're not going to use FY20, um, the COVID crisis to penalize programs. Um, beyond that, I don't have the details worked out yet about how that's, what that's going to look like. I, I just don't have those answers today. Um, and Kathy, this one I think you touched a little bit on, can we readmit students who were with us this fiscal year, but their pretest is over 120 days? And again, as soon as Octa gives us the guidance and approval processes, um, we can do things like that because that student would not need, potentially not need um, a new assessment test. Um, that was, like I said, a conversation that literally I hung up from to get to this one. So as soon as I debrief with Jennifer and we have our next steps put together and we will um, go from there to give you guys direction on that. It's, it's a very new world when Octa is saying the words out loud is alternatives to placement testing. So those policies have not yet been figured out. If we are able to be face-to-face -face this fall, may we offer hybrid classes with online iPathways and Burlington seat time counting toward attendance? Yes. All of these online options that you will be able to use will count as um, attendance hours. So that was the, that's why we're going through the approval process so that you can count them in, as an attendance and generate um, seat time and do all of those things you need to do with out of class um, attendance. And Jane is pointing out to me, if you change your delivery method, a course modification is necessary. So um, if you plan it to be one and it turns into something else, then you will need to modify your course. Okay, guys, I do have to jump off for the, my next phone call for the day um, because I swear to you, that's what I do right now is go from one phone call to another, as I'm sure that you can all relate to that, um, trying to work remotely. I am available, reach out to Nora, get a, a conference call scheduled. I will work with you and your staff. Um, I was prepared more today to talk about virtual assessment, not performance funding. So I apologize for not having those answers ready for you, but I will get those answers now. And um, just let me know what you need. And as I stated earlier, I will be downloading all of these questions and sharing with um, the appropriate sources. And we will all do our best to get as many answered as, as we can. Thank you, guys. Thank you.